Okay, hi everyone and welcome to the King's Red Science Club. So today we have uh, quite a special one, I think, because we have not one but two speakers with us. So we have um, Dr. Barbara McGillibray and Paola Maranju with us and they will tell us a little bit more about open data in the humanities. Um, so I'm going to introduce them in the order they will present. So Barbara will present the first part and she's a lecturer in digital humanities and cultural computation at King's College London and she's also um, a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, her research focuses on computational models of meaning change in historical and contemporary texts um, and actually she's also one of our own steering team members at the Riot Science Club of the, King, of the King's Riot Science Club I should say. Um, and we also have Paula with us today, and she's a PhD student in linguistics at the University of Neuchâtel, and her research focuses on the study of modality in Latin. Um, so both Paula and Barbara are also affiliated with the Journal of Open Humanities Data. Paula is a senior social media editor and Barbara is an editor in chief, and that's kind of what they're going to talk to us about today. So before I hand over to them, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So just a reminder, you have the Q&A box on the right hand side and you can post all your questions through there. You can use the upvote button to kind of prioritize the questions that you like um, and then I'll be reading those out to our speakers towards the end. So um, that's all from me. All of my introductions are done. So Barbara, over to you. Great, thank you very much and um, thanks for having us. Um, I'm very excited to be sharing the experience um, of running the Journal of Open Humanities data over the past two and a half years now um, and to take this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, the movement around open data in the humanities. I know um, a lot of the talks you've had um, focused on the sciences, so I'm, I'm keen to share uh, the viewpoint of uh, the humanities. So, um, this is what I'm gonna. Are we going to talk about today? Uh, we'll start with open, defining what open means, um, and we'll talk about data papers and data journals and the experience of uh, JOD, the Journal of Open Humanities Data. So, uh, what is open? Uh, well, you, most of you may be familiar with it, but this is the um, open definition, um, which um, sets out principles to define openness in relation to data and content. Um, and um, it defines what um, open means um, in the sense of anyone can freely access, use, modify and share for any purpose. So we're talking about data that is free um, uh, to be uh, used in this way. And um, the concept of um, and the open definition is very closely related to the principles of open science and open research. Um, and um, and these were the foundations of um, of the experience that we're going to tell you about. Um, so I introduced this talk by saying that we'll give the uh, perspective of uh, the humanities. So what is special about what we call SSH, social sciences and humanities? Um, nothing particularly special, but uh, there is a bit of a historical context to consider. So the humanities have um, had um, quite a long tradition um, in um, analyzing and, and collecting data sets, but they were not calling it that way. Um, actually, it was um, thanks to uh, the work, the pioneering work of um, a linguist um, and a Latinist, uh, Father Roberto Buza, that the first large um, digitized, well, electronic corpus at the time uh, was assembled um, and the whole process started in the mid uh, of, the, of the 20th century. So linguistics and text analysis was, was at the forefront of this in these initial um, in the initial uh, pioneering activities. Uh, but then fast forward to uh, recent years, uh, we've witnessed uh, growing um, availability and production of digitized and born digital data. So increasingly um, libraries, um, museums, archives have digitized their historical collections. Uh, for example, they've, um, they've, digital, they've collected images or transcripts of, uh, of the books they, they have or uh, manuscripts or older uh, texts. Uh, but also um, increasingly we have, of course, access to born digital data, so web archives, social media collections, and all of these are of great interest um, to humanists and social scientists. 
Um, and in parallel, we also in witnessing a growing adoption of data intensive methods and computational methods that can deal with this amount of, of data. Uh, I come from computational linguistics, and um, so I'm particularly interested in you know, developing methods for dealing with language data, but you know, we're seeing this across the spectrum. Uh, computer vision methods, for example, being applied to historical uh, data sets, art history, and so on. And um, we're also seeing um, a change in the um, so-called GLAM sector, so uh, galleries, libraries, um, archives, and museums. And increasingly, we, um, we see um, uh, professional roles like data uh, stewards, um, and open research uh, specialists who are um, you know, hired in these institutions, and these institutions have a particularly uh, you know, privileged relation with um, humanities and social sciences. So all of this um, ha means that uh, really the, the topic of open data, open research is really is um, at the forefront and is really current. And there is an interest, but also uh, an opportunity to uh, to really change uh, things. So um, I mentioned that uh, we're dealing with a, a big variety of um, of sources. This is just a, a, a kind of brief summary of different um, objects that we're dealing with. So we have maps, for example, historical maps, geographical data. We have traditional databases. We have um, audiovisual material uh, being studied. We have um, text in various forms. We have um, tabular and numeric data and all of these different formats that people may refer to with different terms are what we call data. So some people may call these archives, collections, data sets, corpora, um, the, the, but the, yes, for, for this purpose, uh, they all count as, as data. But obviously, different disciplines have developed different traditions for dealing with these objects. And so the challenge is to uh, reach a common uh, language and, and, and uh, terminology and also framework to, um, to uh, talk about this. Um, so I uh, briefly talked about the a little bit of history and going back to the mid of the 20th century. Um, and uh, yes, text analysis were um, you know, one of the were, were the pioneering um, disciplines in this space. Uh, so um, we had the development of techniques for counting words, for example, um, and then analyzing um, word co-occurrence, all of these and meant that um, definitely data uh, collection was not new. Uh, but what, what um, was particular at the time, so talking about you know, last century and, uh, and the beginning of this century, was that um, the, the focus of uh, scholars was on the traditional publications, so the books rather than the data. So um, there's certainly a lot of work going into collecting data, even though they may not, uh, scholars may not have used these terms, but that's what uh, they would do. Um, and they would do this even at scale. Um, you know, we have projects that collected a lot of uh, data, for example, the, um, uh, the, um, the Father Robert Wuse that I mentioned earlier uh, collected an 11 million word corpus of Latin. So it, it was huge uh, size at the time. But um, ultimately, uh, the, the, um, the most um, important and the most um, high profile um, output of all this work was and uh, is in, to a lot largest extent still uh, the book publication. So um, what is missing in, in this process is that the readers and the, the community get access to the findings, the interpretation, the theories that are written in the books, but they rarely have access to the data and the documentation for interpreting the data. Um, so that's where the opportunity uh, lies. And, um, and that's where data papers can really play an important role. So, we can think of this um, research process as a as a continuum to, with three main uh, stages. On one hand, we have the data that I collected and used 
by the researcher to um, to uh, collect evidence for uh, for their findings, and um, when the data uh, the data set is in digital format, it can be um, deposited in an open repository, um, typically assigning a, a digital object identifier, and that can be a starting point uh, for this process. Uh, but that it doesn't end there, of course. Um, so after having the data deposited in an open repository where people can freely access it, uh, it's important to add a documentation and the intellectual organization that really explains in human readable um, ways um, the thinking and the um, process and the um, decisions that were made throughout the data collection and and um, processing stages and that's where the documentation um, can is is really uh, key uh, data without context is is unusable so we need a way to explain what's in the data how it was created what um, what limitations um, are aware in that process and what was left out of scope as well as what was in scope and once that's in place, um, then we have all we need to uh, to reach the third stage, which is the data paper. So what is a data paper? Um, we can define a data paper as peer reviewed publication that describes a data set. And it very importantly credits um, the creation of uh, the creators of, of the data set. So once the data set is in an open repository, has been documented, the data paper really adds the, the 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 final touches and it makes this output um citable and um and peer-reviewed and there are constant links between these three objects as we'll see in in, in some examples because um they uh, they coexist and they can need each other um but so I mentioned a brief definition of data paper i can go a little bit uh, more into detail about this there have been several definitions that uh, were suggested in the literature with subtle differences. Uh, some have defined data paper as an abstract to describe a data set um, or a, a scientific uh, publication in a journal which um, does not focus on uh, the description of the research process but rather on the research object. Um, or oh, others have defined it as an article that aims at, at the description of the data set and of the tool employed in a research project. Uh, so the main elements of the data paper um, are that the content is a description of a data set and, and more broadly intended also tools. So uh, a research object um, loosely intended is, is the main focus um, and main content of a data paper. Normally in, it is shorter than a, a traditional research article in length uh, because it's meant to be nimble, so to mean to be really um, a complementary to the full research paper that um, where the researcher will explain all, all their findings etc. It's peer reviewed as I mentioned so this is a clear and really uh, key difference uh, between a data paper and simply a data set um, because the data paper is a natural uh, scientific article um, and as I said it, it, it focuses on, on our data sets but just to reiterate it is about openly available data sets gives credit to data creators so that's uh, that's a really important point because um, we uh, we want to acknowledge the fact that the work that goes into creating um, data sets or processing data sets is, is often uh, undervalued so data papers provide a way to get credit for all that work and it's citable which is related to the point above um, because it means that um, not only can I uh, cite the data set as it was deposited in the repository, but I can also cite the, the data paper. Um, uh, so another um, definition of a data paper, which um, which is also quite uh, quite uh, useful, is a data paper is an article that aims at describing the what, where, why, how, and who of the data. So it really needs to give um, the key 
uh, elements that uh, help uh, someone use the data set. So, um, a da as I said, data set out of context is uh, unusable. So we need we need some contextualization and we need to know how the data were created and, and, and in which context and for which purpose. Um, so uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, well, data collection, data creation isn't a, a new as a process, but data papers are relatively new. Uh, and um, uh, as you can see from the plot here, we had some uh, uh, early adopters, but really the the, the big uh, spike in uh, creation of data uh, data papers um, happened in in the last uh, ten years, roughly. Um, and this uh, actually is a study that is a little dated. It's, it's, uh, it only goes up to 2015, but really uh, the, the trend uh, has continued um, uh, in, um, let's say, yeah, almost exponential terms. And you'll see some more recent figures in, uh, later in this talk. Um, so some of you may be familiar with data journals that were established for scientific disciplines. Um, scientific data is a, is a journal published by Springer Nature, for example, and it focuses on life sciences and more generally um, scientific data sets. But we are here, we're talking about specifically uh, humanities um, uh, publications and, um, and we have a few um, journals that um, op operate in this uh, space. So the Journal of Open Archaeology Data was launched in 2012 followed a, late, uh, a year later uh, by the Journal of Open Psychology data and then two years later by the Journal of Open Humanities data. Uh, and then one year, so um, and the fourth one uh, in 2016 was a research data in the humanities and social sciences and it was launched by Brill. We have Internet Archaeology, which is an older journal and has some elements of, um, you know, in common with data journals, but it isn't really strictly speaking data journal. So these are in fact data journals that are only publishing data papers. Um, there is of course uh, a number of other journals that publish also also data papers, but not primarily data papers. And it's quite interesting to look at these figures and and realize that you know which disciplines can started this whole trend. And archaeology is um, is a discipline that uh, can lend itself particularly well to um, more computational and quantitative approaches. Similarly, uh, uh, psychology. Uh, the Journal of Open Humanities data is very very broad in in uh, in scope, and it um, it, it covers um, you know, sub disciplines in the humanities, uh, so um, history. Um, linguistics, uh, philosophy, uh, classics, languages, uh, archaeology as well. Uh, but it was launched, um, yes, with this um, idea of, of covering uh, a really broad uh, spectrum. OK, uh, so uh, I hope I've, I've convinced you that the data uh, papers are a good thing. But just to um, summarize the advantages of uh, of data uh, papers and data journals. Well, for the scientific community, there's um, you know, uh, there's a few a uh, few um, good things um, about having uh, data journals um, because they publish uh, papers about open uh, open access uh, data sets. They encourage uh, accessibility of the of um, of the uh, data and encourage data sharing as well, which is a related but different. Aspect. So once I um, I can I op uh, openly sh um, put um, I deposit my data in an open repository, then other people can uh, can use it. Um, and so it, all of this facilitates exchanges within the community, and ultimately leads to better quality data sets because there is an increased um, control and kind of reuse of of these data sets, and so uh, all of this uh, leads to better quality. Uh, but then for the data paper authors themselves, there are, there are specific um, benefits. We are talking about peer reviewed publications. They count as a publication uh, and citations as well. Uh, and also um, 
no, they, all of this leads to um, higher chances of, of reuse and recognition of the work go, that goes into this. And we run a few uh, events that, um, uh, that uh, uh, went into detail about these advantages and we're getting consistently uh, positive feedback from authors that uh, this is really helping. And this is also proven by the growth of data journals and in the recent years. So they definitely are filling a gap uh, and a need in, in the community. Um, okay, so um, the Journal of Open Humanities data, and well, I said, said a few words earlier, so it was um, launched in 2015, um, and it's part of the uh, series of meta journals uh, that Ubiquity Press um, publishes. Ubiquity Press is a, a London-based open access um, academic publisher. And um, they are uh, they're trying to be quite innovative in not just in the you know, the topics but also in their format. And so they launched these um, journals that are they called meta journals because they complement traditional journals and they focus on uh, certain elements of the research uh, process, so data, but also uh, software. So they, uh, the Ubiquity Press also publishes uh, the general open research software, for example, and they have code papers there. Um, and so the, the goal of, of the of the journal was to promote data sharing and data reuse values in the humanities. It was recognised that there was a need in the community to push <laughs> in that direction, and um, and that so that was um, the main motivation. Um, I joined uh, this journal as a as editor in chief in 2019 when the journal actually was was struggling, um, wasn't publishing uh, very much. It was a kind of transition phase between editor in chiefs, and uh, and I um, I really saw an opportunity there, and it's it's been a very rewarding experience because the journal has grown grown so much, and there's uh, so much we can do not just to publish papers but to really. Um, drive a change in the in the in the in the mindset uh, of people and can give people um, the, the venue for publishing um, objects that um, would did not have a home, so to speak, uh, before. Um, so the team is um, well, we have a, a growing team of volunteers. We all are uh, academics working on the journal um, uh, alongside our academic jobs. Uh, we have an associate editor, editorial assistants, copy editors. Uh, we also have a, 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 an editorial board and um, a social media editor, uh, Paola, who's a senior social media editor, and we're always looking to grow the team. So um, if people are interested, uh, you're very welcome to, to uh, contact us. And we are all researchers in uh, various disciplines of humanities. We have a skew towards linguistics because that's my field and that's where my network tends to um, kind of, uh, uh, focus on. But I'm particularly keen to expand and diversify uh, the team. But we also have classics, law um, and um, and yeah, a range of nationalities um, represented as well, but we're also always looking for uh, for you know, growing and, and uh, diversifying the team. Um, OK, so before I um, now I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Paula, who is going to talk about uh, more in detail uh, various analysis that we did uh, on the Journal of Open Humanities data. Do you hear me? Yes, I think. Um, so Barbara talked about uh, different definitions that we can give of um, a data paper. Um, in the Journal of Open Humanities Data, we adopted this uh, definition that is meant to be as uh, representative as possible of what a data paper should uh, be and should do for the authors and the research community. So it's uh, a publication that is designed to make other researchers aware of data and that on, of their uh, its potential use to them. 
And so uh, for what concerns the contents, it needs to describe methods that have been used to create the data set, but also the data set itself, the structure, the reuse potential and uh, its location. So it really needs to have a link to the location in an open access repository. Um, the data paper doesn't have to be alone in this process, so it's really uh, in a complementary relationship with uh, research papers. So for instance, here we have an example of a data paper uh, published in uh, the journal uh, relational database of Roman law based on Justinian's digest, which has also been uh, connected to a research paper uh, published in another journal and the two of them are complementary because one of them describes so the data paper describes the data set on which the research results are um, are based and the research results are illustrated in another uh, research paper which is meant specifically for that So for um, the publications, uh, the Journal of Open Humanities Data has uh, two types of publication, um, data papers and research papers. Um, they're both uh, data focused though. So the data papers are really, uh, really short and uh, focused on the data set. It's uh, 1000 words max and research papers are meant to be longer narratives. Uh, we're going to see it more into details and can be can have up to 5000 words. Um, as Barbara said, in the last um, last year, last couple of years, the journal um, has um, grown a lot. And so far we have published uh, 59 papers. So for what concerns the structure of the two types of publication, as I said, the data paper is more um, is shorter and very focused on the data set itself. So um, there are four main um, sections that are um, articulated. So for instance, the overview is meant to give the data location. So the link to the repository where the data is stored and the context in which the data was produced. So um, research project, a specific uh, research idea and so on. Um, then the second section is meant to describe the method that was adopted to build the data set. So the different steps, so basically the workflow. And uh, if uh, that's the case, the sampling strategy or the quality control uh, measures that were adopted um, and applied to the data set. And then there's the bare description of the data set. So the name of the of the data set itself, how it's stored in the repository, uh, different formats. So is it CSV files? Is it other types of files? Is it XML and so on? And versions. So if there's different versions of the same uh, of the same data set, uh, it needs to be uh, specified as well. Uh, and then other details, so the creation date, the names of the people who created the data set, uh, the language, um, the type of open license, and of course the repository name. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you before, uh, um, afterwards about that, but there are different repositories where the um, e authors can choose to deposit the data. And then the publication date. And then the fourth section points to the reuse potential of the of the data set. So uh, besides what we have done with those data, what others can do that, uh, yeah, that can be done with that data, even if we actually didn't do that. Um, the research paper for the Journal of Open Humanities data is meant to be um, more um, a discussion of uh, besides the description of the data set also a discussion of the methods used and maybe the challenges or uh, limitations in the in the creation of the data set and that implies uh, difficulties in the collection of data management access 
uh, analysis of the data. So the structure is more flexible because it has to adapt to different uh, topics, different uh, challenges. So we have four sections. Uh, so context and motivation, methodology, results um, obtained on the on the data set and discussion of results and then implications or applications um, of the data and then the four sections can be structured uh, more uh, freely with respect to the to the data data paper. So this is basically the workflow uh, for uh, publishing a data paper or a research paper uh, with JOT. Um, the author has to register in the in the platform on our website. And then first thing is to deposit the data in an open access repository and the journal gives different options. Uh, there's JOT Dataverse, which, which is a repository which is specifically meant for the data set that are described in a data or research paper published by JOT, but there are many others like the Nodo Fixture, etc. Authors can also um, propose one that they like better <laughs> and then it will be um, evaluated by the by the editors. Um, and then it just they just need to follow the templates that I showed in the slide before and submit the paper. The paper uh, has a peer review, so there's one round peer review, and if it is accepted, there's also copy editing and typesetting before uh, publication. Once the paper has been published, it receives a DOI. It's really important and we encourage authors to uh, like uh, to publish their um, the DOI also in the deposit in the repository where the data set is stored because that um, that um, enhances the the impact of the published data set and the published data paper so that the two of them reference uh, make reference to each other. So this is the basically the platform for the uh, dataverse which is uh, meant for data published in JOD papers, data papers or research papers. So um, in our view, um, the data paper is not the only actor towards the and a type of research that is more open and uh, reproducible and impactful. So um, this model the open access pyramid, which has been um, uh, elaborated, suggested by uh, another uh, team member, Martin Ribery, is uh, sees the data paper as just uh, one of the types of dissemination of results that make research open, reproducible and impactful. So we have other than the data paper, we have the project repository, the data repository, and the research paper and we'll see them in details. So first of all, the project repository is the workspace uh, of the researcher. It's meant to be open and it's meant to uh, host all the resource files, codes, uh, intermediary files, any script that was used to create or scrape or uh, analyze the data. It's uh, in a ideal <laughs> word. It needs to be open, and um, and it's also useful because it you can always go back to a different version, a previous version of your work or your files, and find trace back errors and uh, revert to previous versions. The data repository we mentioned some before, like uh, the dataverse, the node of picture, uh, is meant to be used to publish the data set. Uh, it's great because it gives a DOI to the to the deposit and to the data set, and you also get to deposit different versions um, with the same DOI. So. For instance, Zenodo is the one that I know better, 
you get a specific unique DOI to the deposit and different DOIs for uh, different versions if, if there's more than one, but they all, always point out, point to the latest version of the data set and still signal that there are more versions, um, older versions of the same data set. So that it's, uh, that it's clear. And then, um, Besides the data, the data set can also, the repository can also host, host a description of the data set and uh, uh, give some kind of a user, user manual to give instructions on how the data, data set is structured and what type of uh, queries we can perform on the data set depending on the type of, of data. So here we go to the data paper. Um, it's meant to basically to draw attention to the data set itself because of course it can be deposited in a in an open access uh, repository, but it needs to be mentioned somewhere and uh, further described or in the case of research paper, research paper um, sometimes you need also to uh, point out to the challenges of creating a specific type of, uh, of data set. So that's what the data paper is meant to do. So um, bring to light the data set and also the reuse potential of the data set and maybe challenges that people can encounter in building that data set. And finally, there's the research article. Um, we're talking about, I mean, to, for this system to work, uh, the research article needs to be published in open access and the ideally the researcher should choose uh, the gold open access uh, way uh, to publish articles. So immediately available um, in open access online, um, quite um, quite rapidly also on paper maybe and um, so maybe yes in, available in open access not behind the paywall because this would uh, make all the other levels uh, like it would diminish the the value of all the other levels that we follow so far and then it's meant to encourage collaboration among researchers because of course it describes the application of the the applications of possible applications of that data set to a specific uh, research purpose. So for our concerns, uh, JOTS publications, uh, we have three special collections so, so far. So it's uh, uh, collections that are focused on some type of uh, topic in particular. Um, humanities data in the time of uh, COVID-19 and language documentation collections, assessment and recognition are uh, the call for papers for these two uh, special collections are still open. So we have five articles for, for now in the first one and two in the other one. So please <laughs> go ahead and uh, computational humanities research data, which uh, has nine articles, but the call for papers is uh, closed for that one. And besides the special collections, the uh, journal is always open for um, uh, submissions on a rolling basis. Uh, besides publishing data papers or research papers, actually the Judd and the team is interested in engaging in a conversation about open data, open access, and uh, bringing to light the value of uh, sharing your data with the community. So that's why we participate or we try to participate or organize different activities on the topic. Uh, two Open Humanities Data Forum have been organized so far. And it's basically a meeting for researchers uh, interested uh, in values of data sharing and to promote values of data sharing in the humanities community. And all the videos of the recordings from these two forums have been um, recorded and are available on our YouTube channel. I'll talk a bit uh, more about that later. 
And as I said, we also try to participate in this type of, uh, of events besides organizing them. So, for instance, we can mention the participation in the Liber conference in the session working with software and data, um, the participation in the Rad paper, table of experts about data citation, uh, which was organized by Shock, to which uh, Barbara participated. And um, we also participated very recently to the DHNOR conference about uh, publication of data papers in the humanities and the Digital Humanities Association of Southern Africa conference in 2021. So more uh, about Jod's publications, as Barbara said before me, the 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 review the the, the journal is growing, <laughs> luckily, and uh, we can see its growth, uh, especially in 2021 and uh, 2022 has just started, so that's promising. But it's really a peak in 2021 and 2020 with respect to the other years, so that's really encouraging and it shows that more work in the field and commitment can can lead to better results in terms of publications, but not only publications. And we also looked more into the type of domains that uh, Jod has uh, touched so far with its publications. Um, so uh, the scope of the journal is very wide, so there are very different disciplines. We can see that digital computational humanities uh, NLP are quite prominent <laughs> in the type of publications by, and linguistics as well. Mm, but we also have more uh, niche uh, domains like, for instance, uh, musicology or medical humanities. We have some papers on gaming. Uh, but also about social media studies, information studies, and so on. Just by reading the labels, you can see that the scope is quite uh, wide. So as we are interested in uh, making the publication process as more uh, as comfortable as possible <laughs> for the authors, we also ask them to fill out some forms uh, in order to have some idea on the um, on why they choose JOT, uh, how the publication process uh, feels like from the author's point of view. So we have some surveys. Uh, the first one in the first one we ask um, what was the main reason for uh, which the authors decided to submit to the journal and it's uh, encouraging to know that it's mainly the disciplinary scope of the of the journal and its focus on open access that triggered the decision of uh, publishing with uh, with Jod. And we're also quite happy to know that the submission process and the quality of copy editing has been uh, appreciated in most cases. So another uh, thing we were interested in, so we're interested in publishing data papers, but also in seeing how and if this actually has an impact on the reuse of the data itself. So to see if uh, mentioning a data paper or publishing a data paper uh, actually has a link with uh, with uh, people actually using that uh, data set to for their own research purposes. So this is a research that has been uh, done mainly by Nilo Pedrazzini, who is another member of the team. Um, and uh, we focused on the correlation or tried to see if there was a correlation between the number of views of a data paper and the number of downloads of the data set described in the paper on the one hand and some ultra al metrics, so mainly the mentions of a data paper in um, Twitter and the downloads of the data set described in the data paper on the other hand. So for what concerns the number of views and number of downloads, uh, by number of views we, we mean how many times uh, I, we can see it from the metrics on the website, how many times the data paper has been accessed. So 
the correlation is positive, which is encouraging, but it's not statistically significant. But what's interesting is that uh, the correlation is that between uh, the mentions on Twitter and the number of downloads uh, of the data set is actually significant. So uh, that's encouraging because we know or we can suppose that the community is, in, is encouraged and more happy to use a data set that has been uh, um, described and uh, because that shows that the data set is well structured, uh, detailed, uh, peer reviewed and specifically the, the presence or the guarantee of a peer review means that the data set is valid from a scientific point of view as well and uh, it has a good reuse potential as well. So always talking about Twitter, but shifting about the, uh, a bit the topic of the discussion, we also engaged on our, um, we tried to work on our uh, social media presence, especially on Twitter, uh, which is what I do uh, in the team. Um, so we try to keep the the profile active and so we tweet about our publications, events, we tweet about this uh, talk at riots and um, but we also try to engage with the community a bit more and that's what the show me your data campaign is meant to do. Um, so we basically tweet about a data paper or a research paper that has been published uh, in JOD before and we mention uh, the, the the authors if they are on Twitter which is uh, often the case so that's uh, that's great and we ask them to retweet the our tweet and uh, and share an image of their data and that can be anything it can be a, a screenshot um, or a visualization it doesn't really matter. It's meant to show how the data actually looks like because we talk about uh, a lot about data, but it doesn't really uh, link to uh, an image. So um, basically, that's what we ask to the to the to the to the author, and that's the result on the right. So um, CSV files, uh, networks, we really received uh, everything <laughs> in response. And uh, what's the point of all of that? It's to actually show what data looks like to promote open research, to make the authors feel comfortable sharing what they what they're doing and uh, to give them an opportunity to share what they're doing and maybe and maybe um, encourage some new connections uh, even on a platform like Twitter which has been proved to be very very useful also from a scientific uh, point of view. Um, so the point is to encourage the conversation about uh, uh, open access and data reuse and to demystify the yes to, to demystify the, the the conversation and uh, so these are our channels we try to be as active as possible so I mentioned Twitter we have the show me your data campaign but we try to diversify the contents and to uh, have different hashtags depending on the type of content that we're sharing so we have Jot papers and Jot call for papers for what's more uh, focused on the publication of data papers. Uh, but we also have news about the Jot team, basically activities and events in which we participate. And uh, we also point to external events with that maybe don't have much to do with uh, what we're doing but uh, that are always linked to the world of open data that are that are used and so on we also have a newsletter which is published every six months and it's meant to sum up all our activities uh, published papers if new members uh, join the team where uh, we welcome them in the new newsletter as well 
and uh, this event will be in the newsletter <laughs> as well uh, in the next six months. And then, as I told you, there's a YouTube channel which is uh, meant, yeah, to to both to share uh, recorded events like the to open humanities data forums, but also to have uh, smaller videos on on the journal of like presentation of the journal. We have different languages, not just English. There's also French and Italian. And uh, that's it. So there are different ways that you can keep in touch with us and that's just uh, references that you've seen in this uh, presentation thank you okay that's thank you both that was brilliant um i think i'm a bit guilty of always keeping to kind of what's going on in the open research front in the sciences so it's really refreshing to see the initiatives going on in humanities as well um we've got a very busy q a so let's just um move on to that without me waffling too much um, so we've got a question from Emma asking um, what factors would you need to consider when deciding whether a data paper is the way to go for your data? Um, so maybe we give that one to Barbara so Paula can take a breath. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so what uh, things to consider to decide whether um, we have mater uh, enough material for a data paper? Well, the threshold is quite low. I mean, the, the, date, the main thing is that the data are um, deposited uh, in an open re uh, repository and they have potential for reuse. Um, because obviously um, there's a little point in sharing data that no one else can, can reuse. But if you tick these two boxes, then, um, yeah, then the, the paper can be submitted and then it goes through peer review. We didn't say too much about the peer review process, but basically focuses on the, on the structure and the quality of the paper. We don't peer review the data as such, but obviously our peer reviewers will check the data um, but it is, yes, focusing on the quality of the output. So, yeah, hope this answers your question. Uh, but if you have specific con concerns, I'm yeah, interested to, to hear. Yeah, thank you for that. So, yeah, Emma, if you have any, any other more specific questions, you can pop those in the Q&A as well, and I'll get to them in a bit. Um, we have another question asking, what are the advantages of a data paper versus just publishing your data openly with a DOI? Um, so maybe this one can go to Paula. So yeah, basically the problem, it's not a problem, but the, the point of the, um, of the data paper is to uh, go deeper into the data set. So in the repository with the DOI, you find the data set. And of course, I mean, it's, uh, it's nice to find a brief description of uh, what the data set is, is about. Uh, a bit of context and maybe yes, some instructions on queries or what you can do with the uh, with the data set that you find in that repository, but there's no uh, space or uh, it's not even the purpose of the repository to uh, talk about uh, the data itself. So in the data paper, so in the first uh, format, so the data paper itself, you you can really describe the dat the data set. So as I as I showed you, showed you before, you can uh, really describe it. Put your name, data, um, uh, date, uh, languages of the data set, the context and the, uh, in which the data set was created, and also the steps that led to obtaining the data set that you deposited there. And even more uh, with the research paper, at least the one offered by Jod, you can go deeper into um, problems and difficulties that you found uh, in the data set uh, in, while building the data set that don't really find their uh, have their space in the in the repository. So uh, as a researcher, I would be interested in knowing what type of uh, uh, problems I could encounter if uh, I tried to uh, do the same with another type of data, kind of the same data set with another type of data. So that's that's the purpose of the data paper, not really of the uh, deposit on, in the repository. I hope 
I, I hope that's clear if Barbara wants to add something. Yeah, I can just add, thank you, Paula. I mean, I can just add, yes, the, to reiterate the point of peer review. So data papers are peer reviewed, so they are, uh, you know, scientific publications and then they, they, they increase the discoverability of the data because the journal is uh, is indexed in various uh, platforms and you know, maybe at some point it will receive an impact factor, I'm not sure, but all of these things add to the perceived credibility and the quality and the quality control but the real quality control and the um, discoverability of the data themselves so so it's supposed to you know, reinforce and add uh, the academic credit and academic quality <laughs> uh, so to speak thank you Great. Thank you. Um, so someone just wanted to clarify um, that. So when you make your data open, you get a DOI for that as well, and then you get a separate DOI for the data paper. Um, so they were just wondering if that's the intention or if there is a bit of, um, I don't know, um, is, is it needed to have two DOIs, I guess? Yeah, yeah great question. Um, yeah, it really shows how you know this is still being established and that this is still a new concept that people you know, we are still forming it as a community. Well, um, the, the, the UIs are for two separate objects. One is a data set, one is a data paper. So I think it makes sense to keep them separate. So if you, if in most contexts you may want, you may need to, to cite both, but sometimes you may just cite the data set or sometimes you may cite just the data paper. So uh, there's definitely a difference between the two, as I said, we said earlier, um, and, um, and obviously the DOI is attached to to the object that they define. If you update your data, for example, uh, you know, it might get uh, a new DOI um, and the data uh, paper will refer to specific version, like a frozen version of the data. So they all meant to kind of coexist in an ecosystem, ideally with code papers and research papers and data papers and data sets. And they all can reinforce each other, but they are different and complementary. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we're moving on to a slightly different topic now, and I think Barbara, you touched on this a little bit um, already. So someone just wants to know if uh, data papers count as publication, hiring and promotion criteria. Um, so should they be considered as comparable to a traditional paper in that sort of context? Yeah, so uh, great question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it really depends on the discipline and um, there is a movement in, towards in, um, making data count more. Um, I know I've spoken with people, for example, involved in the um, REF exercise, the Research Excellence Framework uh, happening in, in the UK. Um, and this is an increased push to you know, make non-traditional outputs count. In terms of um, you know, traditional metrics, I mean, the, the Journal of Open Humanities Data is indexed in, in various um, platforms. We are now applying to be indexed in Scopus. Um, eventually, we might get a, an impact factor, though we all know impact factors are you know, not true uh, reflections of quality, but they're still perceived as, as quality. So it, um, in, we, we are basically building the, uh, the profile of the journals. So it's still quite new. Um, so it's all about talking about it and, and, and making it um, reach uh, the visibility that we think it deserves. Uh, and then over time, with, I, I believe that it will get the recognition. But certainly it's, it's a publication with a DOI and it's citable and it's peer reviewed. So, you know, it, it definitely counts, but it you know, still doesn't count um, as much as, you know, a nature paper, for example. Uh, but, um, you know, it all helps if we keep publishing and growing and um, we show that uh, we publish good quality content. Absolutely. And I think um, we do see slow movement towards recognising open science and open research practices a bit more in hiring and promotion. Hopefully, maybe that's what I want to believe, at least. <laughs> um, Paola, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that one. Uh, no, I not anything, nothing to what Barbara said. I just, uh, I just wanted to say that it's a great question because I think it's uh, one of the one of the things that maybe um, 
like one of the doubts of uh, some research is uh, to publish, actually publish a data paper that that can be, yeah, one of the one of the things that actually uh, make them decide no, I won't publish a data paper. I'll go for a research paper because it's more uh, uh, valued in uh, academic research. But um, but yeah. I do hope that <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna get better for data papers as well. Absolutely, and it might be a good talking point on uh, your CV as well if someone in the interview is not aware of what data papers are. Um, so we have one question that has sort of been answered already in the slide. So Nick was asking about um, whether data papers actually increase the reuse of data sets compared to just putting them in the repository. Um, so Paula, you, you had quite a bit on that in the slides, but I don't know if you just wanted to add a little bit extra. Um, so we do know that, yes, they do. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, exactly. So, um, as I said, the, the correlation between the views of the data papers was uh, not statistically significant, but uh, for instance, the conversation on Twitter about data papers seemed to, seems to be, to have at least an impact on the, on the reuse of, of uh, the data sets that are described in the data papers that are discussed uh, on Twitter because we see that the number of downloads is uh, is higher. Um, I might add that um, another interesting thing to, to look at would be if the mention on uh, Twitter or uh, using alt metrics on the uh, repositories themselves uh would be yeah will, will have an impact or would be correlated with the reuse so the number of downloads of the data set but um, most of these uh, repositories are not um, subscribed uh, to altmetrics so that's not possible for now but that would be an interesting thing to see in the future if possible <laughs> okay and um, barbara did you want to say something uh, as well yeah, I could add, uh, it's a great question. I could add that actually we are currently working uh, to do more um, analysis on this, focusing on citation metrics uh, as well as alt metrics. So we're looking to establish if there is um, correlation between higher citations um, of the data papers and higher citations of the data set and whether there is a, a directionality in this. Um, so watch this space. We're really collecting the data and uh, looking to present them and publish them uh, this year, hopefully. So yeah, definitely um, we'll be looking forward to seeing what comes out. Brilliant. Fingers crossed then. Um, so we're coming, slowly coming to a close. So I'm going to do one final question. Um, and I guess that's quite a big one as well to finish on. Uh, but um, we have a question asking about um, what are your views on the biggest challenges to open data and open research kind of more broadly um, in that are specific to humanities? Um, so Barbara, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, we can. I'm sure we both have views. I can start it definitely. Um, big issues. Well, OK, so it, it is a conversation that has started and um, is uncovering a lot of challenges. Um, you know, from privacy and uh, copyright issues as well um, to you know academic credit and um, and um, um, so yes yeah, so that you know the structural uh, uh, challenges have to do with the data themselves because in, you know we we deal you know some some researchers are dealing with you know particularly sensitive or um, or copyright uh, under copyright uh, data so as in other fields um, there's also I think still um, resistance uh, towards sharing data with the fear that if I share my data, someone might find an error or uh, might use the data and and uh, and then beat me to uh, publishing some some groundbreaking results. So still I'm still hearing this.
connection. But yeah, I don't know if Paolo um, has more thoughts. Yeah, no. And data sharing is maybe um, newer with respect to others, so there's less um, knowledge about the existence of uh, data papers, the existence of uh, data journals, uh, of practices that, that actually you can deposit your data somewhere that's going to be open and people can see it and read it and give their external input to your data and research. So it's also maybe a matter of uh, uh, talking about that and uh, engaging in the conversation and that's also what Jod is trying to do also via social media because that's what concerns me the most but participation in external events organization of internal events and and so on yeah Great, thank you so much. So thank you to both of you. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Paula, for joining us today and telling us about what's going on in open research in the humanities. Um, the Riot Science Club has one more talk this term, so that's actually happening tomorrow, and um, it's going to be about registration and the benefits, challenges, and practical tips. It will be by Dr. Agata Bohinska. Um, so make sure you check out our Twitter and our website for more details on that. And then we will take a little break and be back in a few weeks. So thank you so much again. Thank you for joining and thank you to our speakers. Bye everyone.